Uh, Nancy comes from a very impressive academic background. Um, uh, I uh, want to emphasize that she has a PhD from philosophy uh, in philosophy from Harvard. So I invited her to sit in the Harvard chair right, right here. The Har Harvard University Press gave us that chair for our 25th anniversary. Um, Nancy, I have, uh, she not only has an impressive academic background, but she has a, uh, uh, a, a large emotional involvement also in her su subject, as you'll find out. Uh, she won, she received Harvard's Plimpton Adams Prize for the most d distinguished doctoral dissertation in the area of the history of philosophy. She's currently a distinguished university professor of philosophy at Georgetown U University and has just completed a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, she's also a graduate of the Washington Psychoanalytic Institute. Uh, in the mid-90s, uh, Nancy was appointed the first dis distinguished chair in ethics at the U.S. Mili Naval, Mili Naval Academy. Um, maybe more importantly, she also at that time began to personally relate uh, to her father's experience as a medic during uh, World War II. Uh, his what had been invisible wounds or wounds invisible to her began to become visible. Uh, and so then drawing upon her background in philosophy and psychoanalysis, she was able to write about the wounds of war in a way that has never been heard before within the military. This is a book about uh, both moral injury and moral obligation. And um, we've had books before about institutional failings, but this is a book about social and individual failings. So here's Nancy to tell us all about it. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Really kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to see um, friends here and uh, and uh, fellow folks. I've. I've worked long with in the military and elsewhere, thank you. Um, I see some of the folks I've been working with for a long time. Um, so uh, afterwards, really, about uh, breaking down the military oops, civilian divide so that soldiers and civilians really can come home from the longest wars in this nation's history. So I don't buy the view that civilians uh, can't talk to soldiers, or, and I use that term generically, sailors, marines, uh, wingmen, and, um, and, uh, and army soldiers, and guards and reserves, or vice versa, that, that, uh, that they can't talk to us. I think it's a resistance, and I, I, I think we, it gets n exacerbated, no doubt, by the fact that many come home and live in on bases or in, uh, in communities that we don't have access to or, or in self-made military uh, communities. But we have to work together, as Barbara said, sort of on a micro level at, at, at breaking down the mill-civ divide, and that's what this book is about. So I am the daughter of a World War II veteran, a medic, who uh, went across the seas about 14 times. I was just in New York um, on from the New York harbors um, to Scotland, um, where I lived for four years. And um, my dad, much to my surprise, I say this uh, as someone who is very, very close to her father, um, when he died at 80, 89, I found his dog tags in his pocket. They were very worn, and he had carried them for 65 years, and I never knew it. Now, that's unusual. There were, weren't a lot of secrets. There were wars, but there were, that gives you a sense that there was a war he was carrying quietly on his own, despite... Uh, beginning to talk to me once once he knew I hung out with officers he thought <laughs> it, was, it was interesting for him to kind of start sharing some of his his world um, so it was a kind of don't ask don't tell policy of our own I guess but it is probably some of the unconscious motivation for my own work so let me tell you about a different kind of homecoming. I do Greek philosophy as well. And I also want to recognize there's folks. I see Francisco here. Hi there. Thank you. He helped. Uh, there are uh, graduate students at Georgetown that helped work on the book. And I also, I see Tony Pfaff here. Colonel Tony Pfaff, our attache, attache, attache to Baghdad, to Kuwait, working with Kerry now and my grad, a, a PhD and others. I'm not sure who, military folks that are here that I've, I've worked with. Um, 
So this one is about a Greek homecoming. Now, many of you know that Sophocles was a playwright. You probably don't know well that he was a general, um, a celebrated general, and he uh, did better than most of those that come home from where he, he wrote plays that lasted uh, 2,500 years or so. And the homecomings were 15,000 people in an amphitheater watching plays like Ajax or Philoctetes. And uh, retold not only in Homer and in the, and in the play, plays, but also on these amazing Greek heirlooms, antiquities that are right now in peril um, in places of Palmyra, Nineveh, and other places where a lot of the records are, are amazing um, ancient records. So when he came home, um, betrayal must have been on his mind because he wrote this play called Philoctetes. And um, the play is about a wounded Greek warrior abandoned by Odysseus on the way to Troy. And the stench of Philoctetes' wounds was so, and his wails, so, so, so great that he was a liability to save. So he was marooned on an island for 10 years on the island of Lesbos, left to defend for himself, except he had this sacred bow. And uh, Wiley Odysseus realized the only way that he might be able to defeat the Trojans was to get his hand on the bow, hands on the bow. So he did what good interrogators do. He built rapport in order to exploit it. But in this case, he did it with a young warrior called Neoptolemus. Um, he stayed in the wings and he sent Neoptolemus out. And what's interesting about the play, and as I write about in the book, it's it, real trust gets built. So... I think a lot about um, the resentment, the sense of betrayal, the rebuilding of trust, the rebuilding of hope in this book. And um, we can't underestimate that. Uh, the Many s the, the, of those that I speak to will say something like, you know, it's sort of become a phrase, you've been at the mall while we've been at war. Um, and th they feel not only that civilians don't get it because only a half percent have served 2.7 million, but also they feel there have been so many, uh, PTSD doesn't begin, post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress doesn't, which is a, a conditioned fear response, doesn't really get at the moral quandaries that a thinking soldier brings home. And by that I mean there's a murky morass of war, especially these wars. There are multiple deployments in extremely population-centric areas, fluid, asymmetric warfare with the justice of the cause of the wars and the prudence and likely success, however defined many reasonably and increasingly doubt. The wars involve no shortage of compromised partnerships under resourced missions, deals with corrupt warlords, um, inadequately trained, sometimes inadequately armed local troops, non-combatants who are themselves fluid. They're sometimes non-combatants and sometimes they're militants. Um, too many children, some armed, some not, all in a battlefield which is a city which is itself filled with traumatized populations from too many decades of war, attrition, and deprivation. So, and they themselves have a hatred for people that come in their areas and may not leave things better than when they arrived. That's coin, that's counterinsurgency warfare that someone like um, Colonel Pfaff writes so well about ethically and it's challenging. It's challenging on those that as my, uh, Josh Montz is someone I write about, and I was the American Psychiatric Association's on a panel with him, and he just says it's an awful and impossible responsibility that sits on our shoulders. He's all of 31, and he actually thinks coin is possibly interesting and defensible in the right set of circumstances, but those, those ideal circumstances are not the ones he was in. And so it's hard to keep a lid on your own troops who are con under constant threat, losing their buddies, et cetera, when you have these kinds of uh, restrictions, on, you can't call an air fire, and the like. So moral injury resonates with a lot of the folks that I talk to. My book is based on conversations over the years, five years in this case, many students coming home to Georgetown, uh, some for their first degrees, some graduate students who have degrees already and are officers. Um, and 
sometimes it feels safe. Um, it feels free from the stigma that PTSD has come to carry. And there's an, an there's irony in that because the diagnosis of PTSD, of course, was introduced, uh, some of you well know, there's many psychiatrists in this audience, in the 1980s in recognition of the real suffering that can come from facing traumatic stressors. And with diagnosis can come treatment and a debunking of the invidious view that psychological trauma is at root about lack of moral fiber. And though the, and, and that was meant to empower, um, and it did for a very long time. But the moral injury is also empowering, and it's on the uptick in the media and veteran circles. But I wanna just point out, it's a very old concept. It's, it's not a new coinage. Um, the idea of a wound that is moral was what Bishop Butler was talking about in 1720 in these famous lectures, sermons, um, one of which was on resentment, when he talked about a, se a moral sense of, uh, he says, resentment can be justified against those who've been in a moral sense in injurious either toward ourselves or others. Um, and he struggled with it because it goes against a Christian command to love those that curse you. So he thought there was justified moral protest or moral anger, and it was what you needed to bind us, to hold a, a society together, to hold each other accountable. So I talk a lot in the book about holding each other accountable um, uh, through moral address, and, and, and it's a kind of call and response that um, philosophers talk about, a reactive attitude that holds others to account philosophers like to say, but it's sort of like gospel singing, or you could think of uh, uh, rock and roll, which was the great inheritor of gospel singing, um, Lou Reed, um, who uh, turned to, quote unquote, the color girls uh, for the response, uh, who did the doo-dop and dooby-doo. Um, if you haven't seen 20 Feet from Stardom, you should. It's an amazing movie about that the lead singer isn't always the interlocutor, the important interlocutor, but it's the it's the it's the um, uh, the um, the choral girls. And in moral address, you're essentially saying, "I'm counting on you." But in the case of resentment, you uh, you um, didn't show me goodwill. You didn't show me. Uh, didn't respect my dignity, but and I expect you to acknowledge that. So from a philosopher's perspective, moral injury is a way of talking about anguish caused by wrongdoing, real and perceived, others toward you, you toward others, others toward others, you toward yourself, agent, victim, and witness are all mixed up there in the mind, uh, as is real injury and apparent injury. Uh, first person, it's guilt, second person, resentment, typically third person. When you're a witness, it's moral indignation. But that's one kind of uh, moral injury uh, expressed by those emotions. But also there's a sense of falling short, and there's no shortage of that in the military. These are men and women who have very, very high standards, that are held to high standards, that often come in with rigid moralities. I was never... I was never not surprised by this at the Naval Academy. Black and white kind of morality and a sense that you can always do all and be all and you can do it like that. Snap, snap, chop, chop. And the result that I, in the cases that I deal with of being under-resourced, of being told to um, get solace money for, for uh, uh, civilians, but then no one giving it to you or trying to bury dead bodies, but having certificates that, uh, where there's civilians having certificates stamped on it, enemy. When you can't have call in arms, but you're just trying to be a good person, this is, uh, you have this enormous sense of shame. So the shame, as you know, can be suicidal. Uh, whether you, whatever your statistics, uh, you believe something like 22, 23 veterans uh, take their lives, and that's a long uh, stretch of veterans from young to, to very old. But again, Greek's a reminder. Um, the Greek word for shame is uh, eidos, and it comes from eidoia, and it's genitals. And it means you're without your fig leaf. You're kind of, you, you're not just falling, you're exposed. You, all eyes are upon you, as Aristotle says, real or imagined. And that's what shame feels like. It's, it's an awful sense of exposure at falling from aspired ideals, often ideals you'll never really supposed to be able to meet, but there's a sense that you can perfectly meet them often in the military. And that, I think, is a problem in training, that aspiration and perfection aren't separated well enough in the training.
So, um, and I think some of, I'll get to some cases, but I think um, PTSD, if it is thought of only as conditioned fear and deconditioning of the fear, doesn't often get at that morass of, 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 of moral um, sentiment. Um, it does, it doesn't often, it, I just was in New York and I was at, uh, doing, interestingly doing grand rounds at Wild Cornell, um, and I was shown a, a virtual reality lab, which was pretty amazing. And I thought it, for prolonged exposure therapy, a particular technique that's used to relive your experience and decondition the fear by being in the presence of it. And I had a helmet on, and I was sort of using a joystick and moving around and with noises and um, and lots of background um, f smells were coming up. Diesel fuel is pretty amazing. And there, I think the, the data is suggesting they're having a lot of luck with this in deconditioning fear, but it doesn't go beyond that. They then, it, it then gets some of the folks to a place where they then can talk about other things that are really racking them. And those often can be about guilt, shame, and the, and, the, and the healing moments, hope and trust. So let me tell you about a few cases. The book is b based on um, prolonged uh, interviews with folks that I've come to know over the years, sometimes four or five years. So one is a guy named uh, Lalo Eduardo Paniagua. He joined the Marines as a way out of a tough life in the LA, LA barrio. And at high school, he met this um, dark-haired, dark-eyed goth girl with street smarts whose name is Donna Hernandez. Um, with a, she had a bookish sensibility, and she ended up in my class at Georgetown in her senior year. So she goes to Georgetown as a way out of the barrio uh, with choices like Duke and Stanford, but she wanted to go to the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, and he joined the Marines. And he deployed to Fallujah, uh, Second Fallujah, um, and Marja, both uh, in artillery. And before that last, the second deployment, they eloped in 2009. That was her freshman year. Um, that was before I knew her, much to her teacher's uh, chagrin and surprise. She said to me, she, she, and she told all her teachers she wasn't pregnant. They were, <laughs> they were, they were getting married because they were in love. And I, she became my student her senior year. And he came home from his second tour pretty torn up psychologically and morally. Um, and he worked at Quantico, and as he said, uh, he exchanged his rifle for a mouse, and the mouse didn't feel so good, and he was back on his computer regularly following Fiddler's Green and other places where he had deployed. So um, he did have flashbacks. He sent his wife, Donna, hurling across the room one night, and he's a guy, as he says, that protects his baby birds. That's, he's, a, he's from a gang in the Barrios, and that was what he knew and resonated with. When he heard her, that was the, the, the signal that it was time to, as he calls it, see the wizard. That's a marine talk, but probably crossed the, crossed the board for um, a, a therapist. And um, he was treated correctly for PTSD, and it, it did calm him down somewhat. But he didn't really wasn't able to talk at all about the guilt he felt and, until he Don actually brought him to a class, and he started opening up in a class of 23, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, we had been talking about some of the stuff from my other book, Untold War, and it resonated with him. And so he says to me. Um, I was in charge of guys, and my biggest fear out there was losing any one of them. They're all like my little brothers whom I trained. And one incident really stood out, and, and that was, so he's artillery, he's, um, they're in placing ground sensors. Um, and I, o I only learned about two weeks ago that at that time, um, this is Marja, um, they're both, they're, it's just sort of pre-surge, uh, November 2009. Um, as an arty, it's called arty, artillery guy, he didn't really have intel units uh, with him. And so though he was reporting a lot of places where there might have been um, IEDs and the like, they weren't necessarily being recorded. And so he lost uh, one or two guys that way. Um, and, and in this case, that wasn't the incident, it was, but it was it, this one really racked him. So Corporal Justin Wilson needed, uh, uh, these are in the book, but I've, I've uh, done the lecture thing and I've, <laughs> I've copied out of the book here, so it's easier for me just to, rather than fiddle for the pages. Um, 
he needed a pit stop, so Wilson jumped off his armored vehicle, found himself an empty hook for privacy, and, and got pulverized. Um, and you have to understand, in these wars, you don't want to leave any trophies behind. You pick up the body parts. Um, and in many cases, Lalo had three such incidents. There's only black trash bags. That was what they had at the moment. So black trash bags are obviously highly valent. They're charged for him. They, they aren't something safe in the house. Um, but what really ate him up about this incident was that they're in an AMRAP, one of these armored vehicles, and he always was pretty sure that every time they made a stop, this is Marja in 2009, it's really dangerous. He gives everyone a warning, watch your step, open your eyes, take care. He's not sure he did it this time. And that's enough to rack him with guilt. And so in his case, he has this angel, and she really is an angel. Some people are gifted interpersonally, and Donna is one of those women. Um, and he calls her an angel. She says, everyone falls in love with Layla, meaning not just that he charms, but also that he's worthy of love. And she reminds him of the self he was. She worked in the president's office at Georgetown, so I'd regret, and the, she often went to presidential events at Georgetown, that is President DeJoya's events. And so at her graduation, which happened to be at, at an event that uh, Jack DeJoya was sponsoring, she had him wear his dress blues so that he could kind of remind, be reminded of who he was. They're getting married. I say married, where uh, Marshall and I are going in a few weeks. They are married. They've been married for five years, but her parents always never got over the fact that she didn't get married in a church, proper Catholic wedding. So they're, uh, and they think she's still, it's by five years, her father still calls her engaged. She says, Dad, I'm not engaged. I've been married. They're getting married to two, with 250 people, not just two witnesses. And he's going, surprise, going to be in his dress blues. He's medically retired or medically separated from the military. Um, but he's going to be in his dress blues. And, and there's a final link to the Philly TD stories to round that story out, and that is Donna has had to conf scheme to confiscate weapons. At first it was a knife. Uh which he was going to use to protect her from all dangers in D.C. And then it was a bow and arrow, and she's protected him from that. How am I doing? With about We're doing fine. Five minutes or so? Five, ten? Okay. So that's one story. Um, it has all sorts of catch-22s. He has a dog that has been, he, that's been critical for his PTSD. The dog is trained and takes a lot of hits um, for him. Is the you know? But he wasn't allowed at Walter Reed in the Marine Battalion program because he wasn't, he's ADA trained, but not trained by Walter Reed. So, uh, Lalo is very funny, and he's doing amazingly well now. He stayed in that program three or four months, but three or four months, but he couldn't be a boarder because he couldn't go with his dog. And so he said, "I've lived, I've lived in mud huts, I've lived in my car, I've lived in worse. I'll go and live in my car." So his friend, who's a, a, a gunny sergeant, said, "No, we have a solution." He takes him to McLean, to a very tawny neighborhood in McLean. It looks really great, and he's getting there and somewhat something a little strange about this place there's a lot of older women that are on the balconies and so he thinks to himself hmm it's an interesting kind of dormitory i guess it's grandmother's visiting day or something like that it's vincent retirement home for officers uh, retired officers and state department officials and widows and he became the only serving young enlisted marine who lived there and as he said he became the, he came in the boyfriend of many 80-year-old women. <laughs> they got very jealous when Donna came. <laughs> she, I have to sort of just boast here, she just graduated last year from, uh, last week from Yale um, in um, foreign affairs uh, with a full ride through Pickering Fellowship. And she's uh, a State Department uh, official uh, who may be stamping passports and doing more interesting work soon. Um, but that was her service. So he went there with his dog and sort of became beloved. He also was on the water polo team. Who knew that 80-year-old 80 80 -year women play water polo at Vincent Hall? But they do. It was an amazing uh, event. And, and that, that was important to his healing. Um, let me tell you two other quick stories. 
one and the narratives in the book are driven by um the idea that um these are real moral wounds and they're healed by a kind of moral address that can help to undo them and through a kind of hope in this case donna really never gave up hope in lalo and and he has rebounded amazingly um Alicia Haran is a young um, lieutenant uh, in the Navy, and I, I got to meet her about eight years ago or so when she was a reserve officer candidate at um, University of San Diego. We don't think about the military women that are in the Navy, but you should, because in her case, she was one of three women on a destroyer of 300, and that's very isolating. And it was a time in the Navy where they were cutting back on training and she was in charge of aft steering. And, but she wasn't given any formal training. So one day her supervisor walks in and she's not exactly where she's supposed to be here with her three enlisted. She's there. She's looking at a book. It's very boring and it's hot. So some of the people were a little bit behind the, the, the steering. And they were actually spill, they were in the shade and, and cleaning up an oil spill. Stuff happens on ships all the time. And a supervisor with a bit of revenge and wanting to make a, uh, a case of her barks out, unsat, unsatisfactory, and makes a beeline to the skipper, to the captain of the ship. And before she knows it, there's a uh, captain's mass. That's uh, a judicial proceeding for herself and her three enlisted. Herself, she's not so worried about, but these officers, re in her case, she really takes care of her, her, her young enlisted. And she, all three of them were, uh, charges were dropped. In her case, she was brought before an, an officer's podium. There was a lot of uh, staging of it. And what, what was critical was that she was a very different kind of sailor. She came from an, a... Uh, 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 L.A. background, was an actress before, and also um, had been doing commercials. She created Mercedes commercials and signed up post 9-11 to put a little bit more meaning in her life. And had a nostalgia for the Navy, which her grandmother, uh, her mother, her grandmother was in the waves, the women um, ready to serve um, a unit. So, and she was, she's a dancer and an actress, and this never went down easily in a very conformist Navy. So she was really kind of uh, scapegoated. She was made an example of. She never was meant to, uh, the, the commander never really thought he was going to, or was, she later found out there was never really any uh, 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 desire or reason to bring uh, proceedings against her, but he wanted to get everyone on their toes, and she was going to be the scapegoat. She doesn't, and this is sort of an interesting thing, she doesn't think of sexism here, although it seems smacking of it to me. And when she started to think about it, it did come out that way. But I, I tell the story in part because she says, um, you don't really understand what happens on a ship. She says the Lord of the Flies syndrome sets in, and a small destroyer of 300 persons, unlike an aircraft carrier that has 5,000, there's nowhere to hide. You're, you're confronted by hostility every day. And she says, even the most efficient ship can devolve into a moral snake pit. When you take in all the lines from a ship, you lose your perspective. And in her case, she had a background. She was a, um, she uh, was a kid who was the breadwinner for her family. She was a young, talented young actress, and so she was um, someone who her parents kind of used rather than fully valued her. But she's but the the, the sea and and the war experience exacerbated that moral conflict. And so after that incident, she said she became the Jonah on the ship, which is talk for the kind of bad luck person um, in reference to the Bible. And she says, that um, I was, she said it really lifted, I had this black spot on me. And she said I was really, um, really, really, I was valued, uh, I'm sorry, let me just start here. She says, uh, to this day I still feel it. I, uh, what he did had a lasting impact on me. With four months left of deployment on the ship, I often came close to contemplating suicide. I'd go to the transom on the ship and just look at the wake and just want to jump. I severed my previous life, all the happiness dried up. 
I had no way of telling my family and friends I was a complete failure. So slowly I started to disappear and she lost 40 pounds and really got pretty suicidal. And she was vulnerable and in her case, is, this is again about trauma that isn't just about fear. There was a background, there was a history and part of it was that she was this child actress who was kind of brought the bread home for the family and never felt fully valued and so that shaming um, that she felt on the ship had some sort of at some sort of history so one day but where where's the sort of relief here and one day she's um she says uh, i was really really on the brink though i appeared fine at work because i've learned over the years how to master control you know i'm an actress and i keep it all in not letting my face crack and then one day i was on the transom and I was, you know, talking to my grandfather. He's dead, but she was having a, a meditative moment. He passed away, but he was in the Navy too, and I was calling on him, addressing him, so to speak, for help. I was lost. And then arrives this admiral who looks like my grandfather, talks like him, and completely accepts me. He accepted the artistic side of me, and it wasn't a big deal for him. So. In psychoanalytic terms, you might say she has this kind of transfer, it's a double transfer. She's attached to a, a grandfather, and then this new man arrives who admired and respected her. And, and, and he was able to appreciate her and kind of recover some goodness for her. And she could count on him for understanding her as a, as a talented young naval lieutenant, and she became an aide de camp. She became a, his aide. And his, she says, the healing came through his championing, not what I was, but who I was, raising me up, acknowledging me, accepting me, allowing me to come to work as an entire, an entire human being. He trusted me enough to allow me to trust the whole of myself. And so, and that hope in her and aspiring on her behalf led to her nominating um, led to him nominating her for essentially a Fulbright in the in the in the um, mi in the uh, military. It's called an Olmsted um, for the be for the best and the brightest for mid mid level career uh, scholarships. So I, that's a, to me a story about moral injury, but also about moral recovery. And the recovery doesn't fit neatly in a package with a handful of episodic treatment sessions that insurance can easily cover and business models can tout. It's really slow growth and recovery that comes, in her case, with a trusting and ongoing relationship. It's the stuff of mentoring, what good teachers and supervisors do when they do it best, help those to grow intellectually, psychologically, and morally so they may flourish. Um, and. I'll, I'll just finish with one other story, and again, we underestimate that a lot of what's happening with women really is about moral injury. Many women told me they felt unsafe inside the wire. Um, they were deer in hunting season when they went into chow hall. Um, some, a kind of remarkable story, um, one woman had her, uh, her uh, bra and panty stolen while she was doing her laundry. And another arrived on base with all sorts of laurels, um, only to be told by her commander that he did everything he could to, to not have her on base, and he was continuing to do so. And he was uh, that she was just she was bringing down heritage and tradition. <laughs> Those are remarkable. That's remarkable lingo to me that it's still in place and not everywhere, but enough to sort of remember that. Judicial, there's, there's a reform bill uh, the Senate has failed to pass so far, Gillibrand's bill, five short, five or six short, to make sure that folks who create that climate, kind of climate, the commanders, aren't in charge of the judicial proceedings when it comes time to deal with sexual assaults and sexual harassment. I think it's absolutely critical. So let me just um, wrap up. And there's much, many more to tell, many more stories to tell. And, and other um, sorts of uh, anecdotes. But um, what I'm really trying to, to do in this book is um, think of homecoming as not just about the military, but about ourselves, about uh, bringing 
military men and women home. Soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, guard, and national service members, contractors, I don't talk much about them in this book, but they certainly are out there and um, close to tip of the spear, if not at it. Uniformed soldiers routinely impose moral responsibility on themselves. It's not just grief or it's not fear. It's moral accountability on themselves and on others. In face of factors that make light of their own agency, whether flukish accident, a case I didn't get to talk about, um, where you use the wrong battery and all of a sudden you turn on the ignition and the turret gun goes off and you blow up the face of your private. Um, it's not strict liability, it's not culpability, but m the soldier who was in charge didn't view it as systems failure, he viewed it as his own moral responsibility. Um, Flukish accident, the tyranny of bureaucracy, public indifference, gappy intelligence, all too lethal high-tech and low-tech weaponry, and above all else, decisions to go to war that it, are at the deepest level problematic, maybe un morally unjustified, and too often driven by a view of lives as expendable. The injuries incurred beg for healing, in part through the consolations of hope, trust, empathic relationships, and more. Um, and these are ones that we ourselves are able to um, uh, cultivate when we uh, reach out to, to soldiers, not through thank you for your service, which I think is met by many with, hmm, sounds kind of hollow, um, doesn't, it stops right there. I was just in Atlanta and that there's, it's a huge welcoming home uh, airport, but it doesn't necessarily go further. So we're all part of the after war. We're all coming home from war and we all are needed to ensure through one-on-one -on -one relationships that we build with service members, be it in our classrooms, in our communities, in offices, uh, through other kinds of organizations. Um, inside the clinical room, outside, the, outside the, the office, the clinical offices. We need to ensure that homecomings are, in fact, uh, coming home. And so that's really the mission of After War, to bring civilian obligations to bear in thinking about the military folks that come home. Thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you. Um, my father was in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. He was one of those green troops uh, that were stationed in England and then when Hitler attacked, made his last attack, uh, there were a whole bunch of green troops that, that went over. He was a draftee. He was in combat for several months, bad combat. Uh, he got frostbite. Uh, that took him out. Um, and that's probably the reason I'm here. Um, but he never, he, he won a bronze star. When he asked, my mother asked what he got it for, he said, oh, everybody got one. And he never talked about the war at all. Um, and didn't want to talk about, it was clear, didn't want to talk about the war. But he, he lived a normal life. He, uh -huh. you know, he was a good father. He was a good businessman. He, he seemed quite happy until he got sick um, when he was 70. And that was just bad genes. Um, so does it matter, or do you think it matters what the war is? I mean, World War II was the good war, uh, and he was Jewish. Um, these wars, um, and Vietnam, which I remember, were much more problematic. You think that makes a difference? Or do people, when they get out there, they have to worry about surviving and keeping their people going, uh, and they just don't think about this was a, th we never should be, we never should have been here. Good. Well, um, those, I think the wars do matter, and I think there's, uh, the, the reaction formation, so to speak, the reaction to um, uh, Vietnam in part was to separate the war from the warrior. Yes. And that's what thank you for your service is in part about. That is a tagline we've started to use to separate the war from the warrior because we didn't in Vietnam. Many were conscripted who didn't want to go and were war protesters but didn't want to go to Canada. Uh, also didn't want to let others serve in their place. So it was all fraught. And there are many yes. in this audience that served in that war. Um, and. Um, and, and also saw patients in that 
war as well. Um, and they can speak firsthand about that. And I write about that. Um, Sam Goodman's there, who uh, was seeing patients in that war. Um, Philosophers, uh, Michael Walzer famously separate, and I see Michael Kazin standing there. Michael Walzer, uh, from Descent and Just and Unjust Wars, famously separated the cause from the conduct and said they were separable in the big movement right now and movement. The revisionist philosophy, and um, Colonel Fassman wrote about that in his PhD, is to not separate the war, the cause of the war, from the conduct and hold individuals uh, themselves accountable, not just for how they prosecute through discrimination discrimination and proportionality and uh, positively minimizing collateral um, incidents, but also for the cause, because if they expose, uh, m make people liable who are not themselves uh, unjust, uh, unjustly at war, that is murder. So it's complex. And uh, Walzer has famously said, if uh, to, uh, to his critic Jeff McMahon, if uh, it would be nice if war was a, a, a war was peacetime, but it isn't, and so we can't really hold the soldier accountable for the cause in the way that we can for the conduct. Um, that doesn't mean that's philosophically. Psychologically, I do think it matters a lot, and I think that some of those I uh, I've worked with, I don't know if they're here right now, but I've written about um, one guy, is Tom Feebrandt here? I don't know if he's here. Uh, Tom, one of my students, was um, in uh, Talafar near Mosul, in that area. Um, it's the, where ISIS is uh, early victories, and it's, it's hard to watch. It's hard to see so much bloodshed in areas w that are so under siege again, with very unstable rewards and ver and lots of fatalities. So I think the war does matter, long long and short. But also World War II wasn't so glorious. Um, exactly. Dresden was no. And uh, again, w Walter makes very clear, uh, Bombardier Harris was never really recognized. He, he, he uh, shot, m he devastated a lot of Germany and civilian populations. And Churchill didn't think, it was conflicted about it. And he didn't, he didn't um, recognize him. Only now I noticed in Britain, in um, Marble Arch or one of the places there's a new memorial, Bombardier Harris has been recognized, interestingly enough. So thank you. Thank you. Long-winded. I'll be shorter. Give people other time. to Hello, Michael. Hi, Nancy. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, one, one quick anecdote and, and then a question. Um, I had a student at Georgetown who had been an interrogator at, at Abu Ghraib, actually. Yes, after we may the, have had the same student. The yeah. <laughs> and then, as you, as you know then, he was probably, he was so alienated from Georgetown, he went back to the army. Will Quinn, would this yeah. be Will Quinn? Yeah. yeah. And he also wants to write a, trying to write a book about it. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And that leads me into my question, <laughs> uh, which is, I'm curious, um, I'm sure you've read a lot of the uh, the fiction and, of course, nonfiction, you know, about Iraq and Afghanistan and, and uh, mm -hmm. Phil Clay's book and Ben Fountain's book and, and, and others. I'm curious whether the people you talk to, if they read it, if, if this, you know, has a impact on how they remember, in mm -hmm. a sense, yeah. uh, they see themselves well, those are writers, we're over here. I'm just curious what the relationship is between, between the sort of the, the culture of of the war, if you will, um, and the people who, who were there. Of course, some of the people writing these books are also veterans. So. Yeah, great question. Phil, he calls himself Cly, Phil Cly. Cly um, he was a public affairs officer. Uh, Marshall and I were at the Brooklyn Academy of Music when we did a, a, thing, a gig together, and he was caught a little off guard when a Marine veteran of World War, uh, of um, Vietnam, kept pounding and saying, were you, a com were you in combat? That always comes up. He was in combat. He was at Dartmouth, uh, I don't remember classics history major or something like that English major who wanted knew he wanted to write and he and those are stories he collected as a public affairs officer Phil Kleis that's redeployment amazing book that he won the National Book Award and he I wasn't sure I gave him my book sort of curious what he thought of it and he adored it and he it resonated with him in a, in a very deep way um, Writing gives you narrative distance, as you know well. Um, these these wars are producing very, very good writers, extremely good narr uh, writers. Whether they'll live up to the, Tim O'Brien's legacy, I don't. I don't know. Um, and very good poets as well. I think. Do they? And so the question is, do they? 
are, do others who read them identify with them? You know, Sebastian Younger is is beloved by many. He's many take them uh, take him on uh, his books on deployment with them. Uh, he's a soldier's writer. I think for my he's a little bit uh, sort of uh, um, thrill seeking. A little uh, I, I sort of read him that way. Um, but I think. Th from the many I have spoken to who are not necessarily will never be writers themselves and don't have that advocation, um, being able to give conceptual clarity of the sort we give in classrooms by putting terms on m murky phenomena, explaining whether it be American history your way or philosophy my way, does give a certain kind of distance and way to touch stuff that you can't otherwise formulate. That's the beauty of intellectual work for those that can do it. Not everyone can. But it, in Lalo's case, it, it, PBS is going to do a special on him. Um, and I was at New Haven talking to him a long time, and he said, you know, that word moral injury just helped to make sense of stuff, because he really just thought it was a lot. He's, he's, you know, he hears the laundromat, the washing machine go off, and he gets jitters. He's, there was a lot of fear conditioning that was going on in his life, but other stuff that he couldn't really begin to touch. He's not going to go into analysis, I don't think, but he certainly could begin to think about it in, in ways that reading my stuff or talking to me really made sense of. So I think um, conceptual clarification and some insight is wonderful for many of them. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so you were just getting at this towards the end, but I think uh, the sexual assault issue in the military is a very big issue. It's a very complicated issue. There's yes. a lot of uh, male victims. Uh -huh. There's obviously the aggressors. There's enablers. There's the judiciary. There's false accusations. There's It's a huge issue, and it's very difficult to talk about, and I have not heard much about it, and I'm wondering if you've ever seen anybody that is from any other perspective, ready to start talking about it. Well, there was a movie that was made, I'm blanking on its name, that I talk about in the book, what, Invisible War, I think it's called, yeah. Um, and someone I know, um, Gene Fidel, who is a, a, you see him quoted a lot in the Times, he's a, um, a legal, uh, he's a counselor for a lot of folks in the military, did not think the m movie was accurate. I thought it was very, very moving. I actually showed it in my class, in any, um, I was gonna say any two or three that said the Naval class. I showed it in my ethics class, um, uh, of 23, one of which Donna Hernandez was in, and I had a special forces guy that was in, and who lo I asked him to uh, look at it the night before and then talk to the class, and he was really moved by it. And in part, he's he's a colonel and is married to a colonel, West Point sweethearts, and he told my class about, and it was in Afghanistan, um, uh, he had a moment, very, very tough moment in Afghanistan, where he needed all the troops he could possibly have on the ground, but he, one of his guys got a phone call, how it happened, I don't know, and, and uh, from his wife, who was deployed somewhere else in country. She'd just been sexually assaulted by an American troop, and he had to leave, <coughs> leave the line of duty to be with his wife. Um, I think people are talking about it. Jilla Brown was very, very moved by this movie, moved enough by this movie and by the victims to uh, do a lot of heavy lifting for a bill that's a little different from what McGaskill's bill is and really was trying to make commanders account of, uh, not in charge of the judiciary proceedings in which of, the, of their own bases. So I think people are talking about it. Of course there are gonna be male victims as well as female victims. The military has always had that. It's not a surprise. Uh, so I think people are talking about it. I think it is very hard for women still, or any victims of sexual assault to come forward. It's hard to seek men, it's hard to seek psychological help. I mean, this is the, the next wave of public work should be in destigmatizing mental health. I mean, it's there's enough shrinks in this audience to be able to advocate for us here. Um, it's critical whether you're in, whether you're a victim of sexual assault, you're a victim of any, or you're suffering. Um, and it's especially hard for women downrange who are all, you know, they, they think it's minor stuff because they're in a war zone and here they are. And some of it is as basic as port, they go to a porta potty and don't feel safe or there's graffiti on a porta potty or they don't know what to do with a tampon 
and um, uh, um, Cam Ritchie, who's uh, El- Elizabeth Cameron Ritchie, who is uh, chief psychiatrist for the Army Surgeon General, just came out with an edited book called Women at War. There are basic things that are still challenges for folks that serve, and we should not underestimate um, that it's still a very, very male-driven military, uh, that s- uh, sexual assault of all flavors is, um, uh, is occurring. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it up. Others? Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk there. Thank uh, you. I haven't read your book yet. Uh, I'm retired Lieutenant Colonel Battle, and I just wanted to hear your perspective. Uh, I do uh, engage with the, uh, the DC VA Center here, mm-hmm. and uh, they've got a new innovation of, uh, they call it integrative wellness. Uh, There are several programs there that uh, are perhaps uh, viewing and embracing more of a wellness perspective aside from the traditional medical uh, perspective. Uh, And I've attended some of the sessions. They have sessions such as spirituality, they have uh, yoga, they have acupuncture, they have and it goes on Reiki, healing, so forth and so on. Uh, and I understand that uh, these particular innovations is, are due to, uh, because there's a discovery, now more of an awareness from the medical community, that is recognizing that there are three components of the individual, body, mind, and soul. I uh, would like to know what is your take on that in view that you know most of the traditional establishment are mostly f- were focused, and perhaps I want to believe some of the the MDs are perhaps more locked into you know their training and their study. Uh, well, what do you think about that? There, uh, thank you. Um, there's uh, military has been trying in all different ways to uh, address the issue of of mental health um, and both governmental and non-governmental agencies, some affiliated with faith-based, some not. Uh, there's uh, one of my colleagues at Georgetown does uh, meditation, mind awareness with the Marine protocol, uh, with Marines, et cetera. Um, I myself have not worked on the spiritual side. Um, I have worked on the more philosophical side, but chaplains, you know, are very, have always been involved in the military as you know all too well, you know, front line, uh, they're, they're there for debriefing. Many of them are uh, psychologically trained. So, and all, uh, let a thousand, you know, s- there isn't always research on all these methods, but they're certainly experimenting with many. And I, I think, from my point of view, the, the most important thing that can be done are people like yourselves, high, uh, uh, commanders, who see their young people in need and get them treatment get them some help. Um, the military's also been using something called Respect Mill. I can't remember what it stands for, an acronym, but it's essentially where internists or any doctor that someone will see uh, when you're in uniform will so give you some kind of psychological assessment so that you're, uh, you might, either might be screening early on. That's not a bad idea either. So um, there's all all sorts of methods out there. I've certainly worked at Walter Reed with someone that works on yoga. That's been a very important component. There's also art therapy. If um, I don't have slides here, but if you were to go to a National Geographic and look at something like Revealing the Wounds of War, you can see some of the art masks that have been made at Walter Reed. They're simply amazing, um, uh, including some of the people I write about, Jeff Hall, wearing one with his family members. These have been incredibly important. He, he has doodles. Uh, they're more than doodles. They're amazing pictures of him, uh, himself being represented as a horse stuck in mud, w- which he went, th- and that was how he uh, expressed the, uh, the, the trauma he felt um, when he came home. Um, he was suicidal, and Walter Reed's art therapy program at the Nike Center, uh, not, not for Nike, but it's the um, National Intrepid Center of Excellence, which is on the campus of the old Bethesda Naval, Walter Reed now, has been doing amazing work. I'd say that's kind of holistic. I, well, mm-hmm. well, so just to uh, conclude, uh, mm-hmm. because as you indicated, uh, 
the response that I've gotten from some of the uh, physicians is that, well, we haven't been trained in that area. These, the individual soldier is interacted mostly from, uh, even from a, a psychological standpoint with those physicians that have been trained in that area. But uh, so even though the chaplaincy program is there, uh, we don't spend a lot of time with the, chap the chaplain uh, within the services or even with the VA. So what happens is that uh, there's a gap. I find that there's a gap because the physician, uh, they would indicate that they're not trained in that area. That's why you have the chaplain. But the people that are writing your notes in your medical form uh, are the physicians and clearly would state, well, you know, that's not my area, so you, you need to see the chaplain, but the chaplain doesn't write notes well, in your medical. Well, chaplains typically have confidentiality, and that's often a reason that... Well, so does the physicians. Uh, not always in the same way as chaplains have, but uh, it's a complicated question. Yeah, it is. And it, yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Chaplains have played an enormously important role and a controversial role of, uh, to some degree um, in, in some cases. Yes. Okay, Hi, Norman. So we oh. time for one last, last question. Norman Shore. Hope, it's, <laughs> hope it doesn't have a dark ending. Um, <laughs> so thank you. The, two of the longer, thank you, two of the longer stories you told were about Lego and the woman who'd been an actress. Yeah. And they both seemed to me to be about extraordinary people who were helped by other extraordinary people. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering, and maybe that's not true, you know, maybe, you know, so how generalizable is uh, this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And okay, yeah, that's the great. Next Thank you, Norman. Um, uh, I don't think of them as you know as as remarkable. It's kind of interesting. Once you start getting, I, I I've gotten to know them a lot, and I, you know I, I don't think of I don't know Francisco. Are they remarkable? I don't know. <laughs> Lalo is pretty amazing. I mean, he is so. But I one person story I didn't tell, and I just want to say who I don't think is so remarkable. Tom Fee Brown. I don't know if he's here. He was in one of my classes, and he was an intel guy, and um, the day and a really good and competent one. Um, never spoke much in class. Was afraid to take the class because it might bring up all sorts of stuff in Iraq in Talifar. The day he goes off for R and R, he's spending so much time uh, outside the wire. He's the eyes and ears for 410 in the cavalry. The day that he goes, he gets word that they've done a raid, sort of uh, the back end of Talifar to clear up some of the stuff that's coming in over the Syrian border, and he loses uh, his best buddy, Lieutenant Edens. Now for three years, and he tells me about it three years later in my office. I'm not a shrink, but it comes up after class, and. He says, um, I, I, I can't quite describe it. It was absolutely devastating. And then he says to me, um, but I, th he was really worried that he w w wasn't there then because he knew how tall every building was and, and, and uh, where to be when, and he would have advised against the, the car going down that particular road that day. Could have and should have and would have, that kind of thing. But he says this, and I don't think it's remarkable, but it is an epiphany of a sort, with an amazing insight that had therapeutic um, value. He, he was uh, home for a longer period, no longer an R&R. &R. He was thinking of re-upping, re-enlisting, and he's talking to his brother, and he's telling me that he's talking to his brother. And he says, you know, I thought about this, what's Iraq gonna be like when I get back after two weeks? I'm really not gonna know the terrain. And I, and there will be gappy intelligence. And it was at that moment, and he had been pounding himself with unspoken guilt for three years. It was at that moment that I realized I couldn't be the one-stop intel analyst for the whole army. Maybe my role was really quite small. That's a remarkable insight. When I don't think he's, you know, I think he's a remarkable guy in having that insight. But I don't think he's. <laughs> it's genius of it. You hope that those moments come at the right time and that they can be healing in the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for questions. <laughs>